I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. Another week, another amazing 19th century writer on Folksy. This week, it's the creator of White Fang, Before Adam and Call of the Wild. Hi there, and welcome back to the second season of Folksy, the storytelling podcast with me, Iser. Our author of the week, as you might have already guessed, is Jack London. Popular lately for his wildlife-oriented novels, uh, Mr. London was actually pretty controversial for a while because of his uh, writing style. You see, Jack had a habit of borrowing and sometimes even picking up piecemeal pieces of content from other writers and integrating them into his own work. This, even in the 19th century, obviously led to plagiarism accusations and copyright claims. Mostly unfounded though, so there's that. Anyway, while he's certainly popular for his long fiction now, Mr. London is widely acknowledged to have been better at short prose. So we are in for a treat today. Let's get on with the tale. Semper Idem by Jack London From the collection When God Laughs and Other Stories Dr. Bicknell was in a remarkably gracious mood. Through a minor accident, a slight bit of carelessness, that was all. A man who might have pulled through had died the preceding night. Though it had only been a sailor man, one of the innumerable unwashed, the steward of the receiving hospital had been on the anxious seat all the morning. It was not that the man had died that gave him discomfort. He knew the doctor too well for that. But his distress lay in the fact that the operation had been done so well. One of the most delicate in surgery, it had been as successful as it was clever and audacious. All had then depended upon the treatment, the nurses, the steward. And the man had died. Nothing much, a bit of carelessness yet enough to bring the professional wrath of Dr. Bicknell about his ears and to perturb the working of the staff and nurses for 24 hours to come. But, as already stated, the doctor was in a remarkably gracious mood. When informed by the steward, in fear and trembling, of the man's unexpected takeoff, his lips did not so much as form one syllable of censure. Nay, they were so pursed that snatches of ragtime floated softly from them, to be broken only by a pleasant query after the health of the other's eldest born. The steward, deeming it impossible that he could have caught the gist of the case, repeated it. Yes, yes, Dr. Bicknell said impatiently. I understand. But how about Semper Idem? Is he ready to leave? Uh, yes, they're helping him dress now, the steward answered, passing on to the round of his duties, content that peace still reigned within the iodine-saturated walls. It was Semper Idem's recovery which had so fully compensated Dr. Bicknell for the loss of the sailor man. Lives were to him as nothing, the unpleasant but inevitable incidents of the profession, but cases, ah, cases were everything. People who knew him were prone to brand him a butcher. But his colleagues were at one in the belief that a bolder and yet a more capable man never stood over the table. He was not an imaginative man. He did not possess and hence had no tolerance for emotion. His nature was accurate, precise, scientific. Men were to him no more than pawns, without individuality or personal value. But as cases, it was different. The more broken a man was, the more precarious his grip on life, 
the greater his significance in the eyes of Dr. Bicknell. He would as readily forsake a poet laureate suffering from a common accident for a nameless mangled vagrant who defied every law of life by refusing to die as would a child forsake a punch and judy for a circus. So it had been in the case of Semper Idem. The mystery of the man had not appealed to him nor had his silence and the whale romance which the yellow reporters had so sensationally and so fruitlessly exploited in diverse Sunday editions. But Semper Idem's throat had been cut. That was the point. That was where his interest had centered. Cut from ear to ear, and not one surgeon in a thousand to give a snap of the fingers for his chance of recovery. But, thanks to the swift municipal ambulance service and to Dr. Bicknell, he had been dragged back into the world he had sought to leave. The doctor's co-workers had shaken their heads when the case was brought in. Impossible, they said. Throat, windpipe, jugular, all but actually severed, and the loss of blood frightful. As it was such a foregone conclusion, Dr. Bicknell had employed methods and done things which made them, even their professional capacities, shudder. And lo, the man had recovered. So, on this morning that Semper Idem was to leave the hospital, hale and hearty, Dr. Bicknell's geniality was in no ways disturbed by the steward's report and he proceeded cheerfully to bring order out of the chaos of a child's body which had been ground and crunched beneath the wheels of an electric car. I'm pretty sure that's not the same kind of electric car that we see nowadays, guys. So, yeah. As many will remember, the case of Semper Idem aroused a vast deal of unseemly yet highly natural curiosity. He had been found in a slum lodging with throat cut as aforementioned and blood dripping down upon the inmates of the room below and disturbing their festivities. He had evidently done the deed standing, with head bowed forward that he might gaze his last upon a photograph which stood on the table propped against a candlestick. It was this attitude which had made it possible for Dr. Bicknell to save him. So terrific had been the sweep of the razor that had he had his head thrown back, as he should have done to have accomplished the act properly, with his neck stretched and the elastic vascular walls distended, he would have of a certainty well nigh decapitated himself. Oh well, yeah, no shit. <laughs> At the hospital, during all the time that he travelled the repugnant road back to life, not a word had left his lips nor could anything be learned of him by the sleuths detailed by the chief of police. Nobody knew him, nor had ever seen or heard of him before. He was strictly, uniquely, of the present. His clothes and surroundings were those of the lowest labourer, his hands the hands of a gentleman. But not a shred of writing was discovered. Nothing, save in one particular which would serve to indicate his past or his position in life. And that one particular was the photograph. If it were at all a likeness, the woman who gazed frankly out upon the onlooker from the card mount must have been a striking creature indeed. It was an amateur production, for the detectives were baffled in that no professional photographer's signature or studio was appended. Across a corner of the mount, in delicate feminine tracery, was written, Semper Idem, Semper Fidelis. And she looked it. So Semper uh, Idem means always the same, and Semper Fidelis means always faithful. That last one is actually the motto of the US Marine Corps. Across a corner of the mount, in delicate feminine tracery, was written, Semper Idem, Semper Fidelis. And she looked it. As many recollect, it was a face one could never forget. Clever half-tones, remarkably like, were published in all the leading papers at the time. 
but such procedure gave rise to nothing but the uncontrollable public curiosity and interminable copy to the space writers. For want of a better name, the rescued suicide was known to the hospital attendants and to the world as Semper Idem. And Semper Idem he remained. Reporters, detectives and nurses gave him up in despair. Not one word could he be persuaded to utter. Yet the flitting conscious light of his eyes showed that his ears heard and his brain grasped every question put to him. But this mystery and romance played no part in Dr. Bicknell's interest when he paused in the office to have a parting word with his patient. He, the doctor, had performed a prodigy in the matter of this man, done what was virtually unprecedented in the annals of surgery. He did not care who or what the man was, and it was highly improbable that he should ever see him again, but like the artist gazing upon a finished creation, he wished to look for the last time upon the work of his hand and brain. Semper Idem still remained mute. He seemed anxious to be gone. Not a word could the doctor extract from him, and little the doctor cared. He examined the throat of the convalescent carefully, idling over the hideous scar with the lingering, half-caressing fondness of a parent. It was not a particularly pleasing sight. An angry line circled the throat, for all the world as though the man had just escaped the hangman's noose and, disappearing below the ear on either side, had the appearance of completing the fiery periphery at the nape of the neck. Maintaining his dogged silence, Yielding to the other's examination in much the manner of a leashed lion, Semper Idem betrayed only his desire to drop out from the public eye. Well, I'll not keep you, Dr. Bicknell finally said, laying a hand on the man's shoulder and stealing a last glance at his own handiwork. But let me give you a bit of advice. Next time you try it on, hold your chin up. So... Don't snuggle it down and butcher yourself like a cow. Neatness and dispatch, you see. Neatness and dispatch. Semper Idem's eyes flashed in token that he heard and, and a moment later, the hospital door swung to on his heel. It was a busy day for Dr. Bicknell and the afternoon was well along when he lighted a cigar preparatory to leaving the table upon which it seemed the sufferers almost clamoured to be laid. But the last one, an old rag picker with a broken shoulder blade, had been disposed of and the first fragrant smoke wreaths had begun to curl about his head when the gong of a hurrying ambulance came through the open window from the street followed by the inevitable entry of the stretcher with its ghastly freight. Lay it on the table, the doctor directed, turning for a moment to place his cigar in safety. What is it? Suicide, throat cut, responded one of the stretcher bearers. Down on Morgan Alley. Little hope, I think, sir. He's most gone. Eh? Eh? Well, I'll give him a look anyway. He leaned over the man at the moment when the quick made its last faint flutter and succumbed. It's Semper Idem, come back again, the steward said. Aye, replied Dr. Becknell. And gone again. No bungling this time. Properly done upon my life, sir, properly done. Took my advice to the letter. I'm not required here. Take it along to the morgue. Dr. Bicknell secured his cigar and relighted it. That, he said between puffs, looking at the steward, that evens up for the one you lost last night. We're quits now. And that was today's tale. Is it just me or are these getting better each and every single story that we do? It's like... This list is arranged in an ascending order of amazingness. Or maybe it's just that I'm getting better at searching for stories, but either way, talking about Semper Item. Well, I've heard this phrase repeated a lot that death is sometimes the final form of medicine and the final uh, help that you can give anybody as a medical professional because to exist in constant pain 
for many is worse than dying. Thing is, the concept of euthanasia and uh, voluntary uh, killing of oneself is not new, and it has been debated to no end. And Jack London didn't really attempt to debate it either. He just he just presented a story in which uh, the main character is somebody who, just like the reader, is probably someone who has commented a couple of times on suicide and killing yourself, but is not someone who has had to face the proposition for themselves just because their life till that point has been good. And I don't know, I just think this was a really impressive story and I would like to come back to Jack London sometime later. Yeah, this, this also cleared up for me the fact that popular authors are abridged a lot when they're mass published. And I've, I've ended up reading mostly children's editions of Jack London's books and even Jules Verne's books till now I was researching for uh, the podcast episode for two weeks from now and yeah we'll be, t- we'll be talking about this but what did you think about today's story got something to say well we're here to hear if you're listening on YouTube leave us a comment downstairs but if you're elsewhere you can now leave me a voice note and I'll even add that to the next episode link for this is in the description Today's music selection comes from Prod Rhythm Man, as is basically standard now for us here at Folksy. There's a link to the track in the description, so go show him some love too. And that's pretty much it for this episode of Folksy. Um, catch us here next time as we go somewhat classic in approach. Adios.